Uh, as you all may or may not know, that about three years ago, it, uh, the leaders in WEC asked a small committee of us, a multicultural, diverse committee of WECers, to put together a re-expression, as it were, not to change our core values in terms of faith and finance, but to re-express them in a way that might communicate well, communicate well to ourselves, uh, as well as communicate maybe, hopefully, to others, our churches and supporters, uh, what our core values are in terms of faith and finance. And so we've really uh, been working on this, and th this intercon, the meeting of all our WEC leaders, we came up with this expression, this uh, core document that we're going to be looking at together. And we made some changes even at intercon, but the result is really, it's, an, a, doc it's a document that excites me, not because it's perfect, but because it really has some beautiful truths in it, um, some very powerful truths about who God is and what we believe in WEC. And so I want to walk you through this document and uh, allow you to see, in a sense, hopefully some of these awesome truths that it talks about in terms of who God is and what we believe in WEC, what we hope to believe in WEC. Uh, we are obviously real people, and we don't always trust as we should or believe as we should, but this is our goal, this is our vision, this is who we are and who we want to be as WECers. So let me just pray as we look at this document. Lord, we do want to see you this morning. And we thank you for the truths that are here. They're real, Lord. And uh, Lord, would you help us, help me as I explain it, help us to see you in, in all your grandeur and your majesty. You're an awesome God. And we thank you for this privilege. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, when you, when you talk about finances, in a sense you're talking about treasure. Uh, but we felt like it was very important to start our faith and finance policy with a statement of what is our real treasure. And our real treasure, ultimately, as you know, is not finances. Our real treasure is Him. And this is how we start. We start with a focus statement. It's a broad statement. It says, Our focus is on the living triune God who is of supreme value and the ultimate satisfaction of our lives. Therefore, above all else, we desire to know Him, love Him, worship Him, obey Him and please Him with the totality of our lives. Um, he is our treasure. He is our ultimate satisfaction. Not our finances, uh, but he is, how, he is the supreme value and the ultimate satisfaction. And you'll see throughout this document, we talk a lot about Christ and the Holy Spirit. Um, we thought in this intro statement, such a broad statement, we would start out with the Trinity, with the triune God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so we say that our focus is on the living triune God. And He is of supreme value, and He's the ultimate satisfaction. And so really what our hearts desire to do is to know Him. Like Paul said, you know, uh, above all, I want to know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His suffering. And uh, we want to love Him, to love Him with all our heart and all our soul and all our mind and all our strength. And so these, of course, you could have added, we could have added lots of other verbs, but this is really an encapsulation, in a sense, of our heart desire. It really, uh, above even our financial security, above any other thing, He is our treasure, and we want to trust and treasure Him. Now, this statement, of course, could be said by all followers of Jesus, and so this is not a weak, unique statement in any way. Hopefully that others who read this statement, churches and individuals can say, yes, that too is true for me. And so, uh, but this is really, we felt like this is important for us to start, keep the focus as to our greatest treasure. Point number two, of course, we in WEC have been called to another purpose. We've joined ourselves together because we believe in the purposes of WEC. God has called us to the purposes of WEC. And we, of course, we have our three objectives. We have reaching people, planting churches, and missions mobilization. But this is kind of a broad statement of what that objective is. And the truth is, because we know this treasure, because we have tasted and seen that He is good, we want others to know Him and to love Him and to worship Him and to please Him and to obey Him. And particularly, our particular passion in WEC is those who have never heard, the unreached. Those who have never had any opportunity or access to hear and to taste and see this awesome God that we serve. And so our purpose then, again, a very broad statement, but our purpose as Weckers is that we exist so that those who have never heard will come to know, love, worship, obey, and please Jesus Christ above all else. 
And in that context then, those two big stuff, broad statements, then we start talking about finances. And this point number three is really, for us it's kind of the cornerstone of the whole financial policy. And it's worded very, very carefully. But it's a beautiful statement that says, Christ is worthy of our absolute trust. And notice that we're not talking about we absolutely trust Christ. Because uh, we as Wackers, we don't necessarily always, I know I don't, always absolutely trust Christ. But He is always worthy of absolute trust. Whether or not I absolutely trust Him, the point is, He is worthy of absolute trust. He is worthy of every trust that we can put in Him. He is worthy of our absolute trust. He was worthy, He is worthy, even today, of our absolute trust. And that's the foundation of, of our faith in and finance policy. Of course, again, another true statement for, for most missions, most Christians, all Christians hopefully can affirm this truth that Christ is worthy of our absolute trust. You know, Hudson Taylor, of course, said, you know, it's not that I have great faith, it's that I have faith in a great God. And that's the point. He is worthy of our absolute trust. And that's the cornerstone of our finance policy. Point number four. We know that as we seek first Christ in His kingdom, we will have all we need to honor and serve Him. And of course, this comes from Matthew 6.33, doesn't it? Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you as well. Um, this, it's talking about what we ultimately are seeking. It's talking about our first place desire. What do we really want? What is our treasure? What is it that we really treasure in first place? How do, what do we desire? Not, the, not just what we say we want, but what do you really want as your first place desire? And then we know that as we seek this treasure, Him, Christ Himself, as our first place desire, we will have all that we need. You know, it says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added to you. Well, what is that all these things? Of course, in Philippians 4.19, Paul says, And my God will supply all your needs according to His riches and glory. And what does that mean when he says, All your needs, or all these things? What does that really mean? Well, we think that it means that we will have all we need for the greatest treasure. It doesn't necessarily mean we will have all we want. It doesn't necessarily mean, does it, that we will have all, um, even our physical needs. It doesn't necessarily mean you will always have enough to eat. Uh, Paul himself went hungry. It doesn't necessarily mean you will have freedom from pain, does it? Uh, it doesn't even necessarily mean you will have freedom. Uh, Paul was in prison. He was the one that wrote this, that God, my God will supply all your needs. What does it mean? I think it means that God will give us all we need to honor and serve Him. And if our greatest desire, if really that focus statement is really true, if our greatest passion is to love Him and to know Him and to honor Him, then He will give us that. And that you can have in the deepest trial and in the darkest dungeon. Uh, you can by God's grace, honor Him in such a deep and dark place. Now, it doesn't guarantee you will. We might fail in the deep trial or in the darkest dungeon. But if we fail, if we come up short, it won't be because God came up short. It won't be because He wasn't there or because He doesn't give us what we needed to honor and to serve Him. And we can trust. I mean, the wonderful thing about this is if your greatest desire is to honor and love and know Jesus, you will have it. That is a promise. And you will have in the deepest, darkest trial, you will have what you need to know Him, and to love Him, and to honor Him. And that's how we interpret this statement in Matthew 6.33 for WEC. Point number five. We acknowledge that God provides for His servants in a multitude of ways, using whatever form manner or time he may choose. Uh, basically, what this is a statement is that God is our Jehovah Jireh, He is our provider, and He provides in different ways, even for those of us who are in full-time ministry. You know from 1 Corinthians 9 that Paul said, he talked about the rights of a gospel laborer to live from the gospel. And yet, a few verses later, in verse 15, he says, but, but I did not choose to use those rights. And he and Barnabas worked for a living. And so here's this concept that God can provide in multitude of different ways. For some, He might provide in the traditional means of income from the gospel. 
or through others he might provide through other means, like for Paul. Um, and you just look at the diversity of ways that God has provided throughout Scripture. He provided for Nehemiah and the rebuilding of the wall through the king and his forest of timber. He provided for Elijah. Remember Elijah was provided first for his food needs by the raven, and then later on God said to him, go to this widow and she will provide your needs. Uh, the Levites were provided by the taxes of other Israelites. Uh, Jesus once provided the temple tax by a coin out of a fish's mouth. Uh, he provided food for the multitudes by this miraculous uh, multiplication of existing resources. And so all this is just to say that we acknowledge that God is God. And that God is not limited to any one means of financial provision. And that He provides in a multitude of ways. Now that's not to say that every way of gaining money is God's ordained provision. Uh, I'm not sure gambling or uh, uh, dishonest gain is God's means of provision. Obviously it's not. But it does mean that God can and God does use a multitude of ways to provide for us as His servants. And so we don't limit God in that sense. Point number six. All of this is preceded comes down in a sense, this is kind of a central point here, that we recognize that the attitude of our hearts is of ultimate importance in God's eyes. You know, God really cares about our hearts, doesn't He? I mean, uh, behaviors is one thing, but He really is looking in our heart. You know, in Second Chronicles 16, it says, The eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to Him. And of course, First Samuel 16, Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And so, really, he is looking for hearts that really trust him, and really treasure him, and really look to him. That's what, he, that's what he's looking for. And, and the same behavior can actually have two different heart attitudes behind it, couldn't it? So, he's really looking for our hearts that trust him, and treasure him, and look to him first, when we are looking for our financial needs. Now, we also recognize that hearts that are really trusting and treasuring will have some behaviors that result as, as, from that. And so there will be some outward manifestations of our heart attitudes when they are right. And so therefore we say in relation to our material needs, we desire our lives to be marked by, and here's this list of about <clears throat> seven different um, types of behaviors. And one of those is consistent prayer. Um, you know, if we really believe that God is our provider, and if we really believe that God has asked us to ask Him, you know, He said in the Lord's Prayer, Give us this day our daily bread. And if we also really want God's honor, and we recognize that God is really honored, has the potential to be honored when we ask Him and He responds, then we will pray. We will pray for our financial needs. Now hopefully that won't be the only thing we pray about. Hopefully we'll pray about lots of things, and hopefully finances is maybe not, is not the primary thing that we pray about. But we will be looking to God in prayer. That will be, because of our heart attitude of really looking to Him, it will be expressed in consistent prayer. Point number B. Um, we desire our lives to be marked by communication with people, but without focusing on or appealing for funds. Now this last section, without focusing on or appealing for funds, is actually a quote uh, right from P's and P. And this really comes down to one of our distinctives in WEC, this not appealing for funds. Some people call it non-solicitation. Um, this is really one of our distinctives. Um, and so we wanted to try to express this uh, in, a, in a larger way than just this statement and see if we could express it in a way that would, one would, would express why we do this, why we do non-solicitation, and what's the core value, what's the core purpose behind non-solicitation. And so that's why we came up with this statement number eight. Um, that's the P's and P's section, but statement number eight, uh, which is really our attempt to express this clearly and succinctly. So I'm going to jump ahead to statement number eight and talk about this core distinctive of WEC. Statement number, uh, number eight says, We have sensed the God's call to us as a fellowship to follow financial practices which express that Christ is worthy of our trust for the practical realities of our lives, even today. Now, <clears throat> if our focus, if our heart's desire is to honor Christ and to glorify Christ, if that's really our passion, then if you think about us as individuals here, even in this room, each one of us has a potential to 
honor and glorify and reflect something of the majesty of Christ in your life. And it's different. You know, for one person it might be, uh, for hope, the, the kind of organizational ability of God. The, the kind of, for somebody else it might be the compassion, the hospitality uh, of God, the love of God, the compassion of God. You know, different aspects. And one individual doesn't display the whole character of God, do they? Uh, it's like a diamond, you know. Each of us is like a facet on a diamond. And one facet itself can't display the whole glory of God. But you take them all together, you take the whole body of Christ and all of our unique, different personalities and, and, and giftings, in a sense, that then displays a bigger picture of the glory of God. And I think, in, a, in many ways, this is true for organizations as well. No one organization, whether it's WEC or another mission, has that capacity to display the full glory of God, every aspect of God's character. But each of us, in its unique way that God has created us, has the potential to display some aspect of God's glory, or some aspects of God's glory. And one of the unique aspects, I think, or unique characteristics of WEC, is, or are, our financial practices. Uh, now, I hope that's not the only thing that's unique and displays God's glory in WEC. Um, I hope that our multicultural diversity, in a sense, kind of is a, is a display of this multicultural uh, diverse part of God. I hope that our love for the church and for church planting kind of displays God's passion for the church, Jesus' love for the church. So I hope it's not the only thing. But it is one of the unique facets of uh, the character of God that I think has been put in us from the beginning. And this came from our beginning, didn't it? It came from our founder, C.T. Studd. And of course he wasn't the only one. He had colleagues like Hudson Taylor and George Mueller and others who used this practice of non-solicitation. Um, and so that was birthed into WEC, and it has been affirmed in WEC. As our leaders, from time to time, every so many number of years, they bring this to the Lord and ask the Lord, is this a practice that you would still have us to follow? And to this point, he's always seemed to say yes, and WEC has embraced this and done it. Now, you'll notice that uh, this doesn't have any biblical verses connected with it. And the reason is because we are not saying in WEC that this is a biblical mandate. We're not saying Scripture says you should do it like this. It's not anti-biblical. But what we're saying is that this is a unique call on us. And that's where the first this phrase, we have sensed God's call to us as a mission. Just in the same way that with the Bible translators, with the Bible translators, their focus is Bible translation. And that came from their founder in the early days. And they have continued that focus. Now, they would never say that Bible translation is the biblical mandate for all organizations. And they would not say this is more spiritual or better than other organizations. They would just say this is God's unique call upon us to be in Bible translation. And in that same sense, we have sensed in WEC, this is God's unique call to us. It's not better than other people. Uh, it's not the more spiritual thing. It's just kind of God's unique call to us as a mission that has the potential to display one aspect of His glory. And what is that aspect that it has the potential to display? Well, if you think about it, if you only ask God, if you ask God only for your material needs, then it is very dependent on God to respond. And so when He responds, it's a God thing. Uh, it, he gets the credit. And it has the potential to show that Christ is worthy of our trust for the practical realities of our, day, our lives. Even today, even in this year, God is able and worthy and of providing for our practical, the practical realities of our lives. And so it has the potential to do that. And it particularly has that potential if you do it with deep joy and glad confidence in God. If you really do it with a heart that trusts Him and treasures Him above all. And if you testify to God's goodness. If you let others know about this awesome God that has provided your needs then it has the potential to glorify God. It also has the potential not to. It can be, non-solicitation can be a technique. It can become just a technique that you do because uh, Weck says you have to do it. Uh, it can be a technique that you do because it's easier. It's easier not to ask for money. But in those cases, it becomes devoid of joy, uh, devoid of the supernatural power of Christ, and is not uh, necessarily honoring and giving glory to Christ. And so it is possible, it is possible that we re have retained the technique, but we've lost the core value. Um, and so a part of this whole paper has been a renewal for us 
to be renewed in the core value, that the reason why we do not send down solicitation is not because of a biblical mandate or not because we think it's more spiritual, it's because we've sensed God's unique call on us as a mission to use financial practices to display that Christ is worthy of our trust for the practical realities of our lives, even today. That's kind of how we have come to express it. And hopefully that is helpful in some way for ourselves and for the outside world that looks in on this financial practice. Now we'll go back to these uh, behaviors and I'll go through them fairly quickly because um, a lot of them are self-explanatory. But uh, point number C, a sensitivity to the Spirit to discern God's specific ways. Of course, if God provides in a multitude of ways, we need to listen. We need to have hearts open to this wonderful... uh, Jehovah Jireh who provides for us. A willingness to live simply and sacrificially, being content and thankful with what God provides. And the key word here is a willingness to live simply and sacrificially. We're not saying that sacrifice has some sort of merit and that makes us better or is kind of something that we have to do to be a good Christian. Uh, What we're saying is that if our focus is on this great treasure and if if sacrifice will enable us to honor Him, and will enable us to show this great treasure to the unreached, then we are willing to sacrifice. We're willing to lose the lesser treasures so that we will have the greatest treasure or that others will have this greater treasure. Um, And our goal is to be content and thankful. If God calls us to a life of sacrifice and simple living, to be content and thankful in it. Not grumbling, you know, well, we just have to do this. But this kind of joy, you know, this, the story of the buried treasure, when the man found the treasure, he put it back, he went and sold everything he had, and it says in the, in the parable, and in his joy went and bought that field. And so you ask the question, how can he have such joy when he just lost everything? And the obvious answer is that because what he was to gain is of so much more value than what he was to lose. And so when you have joy in the face of suffering, it points to a greater treasure. And this is the beautiful thing about being content like Paul was. Content whether you're in plenty or in want. Uh, Whether you're well-fed or hungry. That contentment points to another treasure, doesn't it? It points to to the fact that there is something more important to you than whether you're well-fed or hungry. And of course that contentment comes. We should be content in plenty as well. As long as that's for the honor of Christ and honor as long as that is for others to know this great treasure, then we can be content in plenty and in want. Uh, John Piper says, um, Loss and suffering, joyfully accepted for the kingdom of God, show the supremacy of God's worth more clearly in the world than all worship and prayer. That's quite a statement. Loss and suffering, joyfully accepted display Christ's work because it points to something more important than our own lesser treasures. It points to a greater treasure. So we are willing to live sacrificially if that be God's path for us. Uh, Good stewardship of the resources, of course, entrusted to us and that key is entrusted to us, you know, uh, from the parable of of the stewards. The resources are entrusted. They're not just given and then they become ours. They're entrusted to us. We are stewards of God's resources and so we have a responsibility to look to the Master to see how he wants to use his resources. Attitudes of liberal generosity. God loves a cheerful giver. And we love to give. It's a delightful thing to be able to give to each other, uh, to the needs that are there. Giving testimony uh, to his provision and trustworthiness. You know, if really our objective is to honor Christ and we want him to get the credit, then we should give testimony to what he has done. Uh, this is a practice that goes way back in WEC. I mean, this is a, an, a, an old document that talks about in the early days of WEC, every anonymous gift it was published in the WEC magazine. And uh, what they were doing was they were giving testimony to this amazing God who just keeps providing. And so, again, it's the hard attitude. We give testimony to God's provision, not as a subtle way to get more finances, but as an authentic sense that God has done this and we want you to know about it and we want God to get the honor and the credit. And so giving testimony is a part of WEC financial policy. Integrity and transparency, of course, that integrity just says, you know, we in WEC want to, this is our goal, we want to say who we really are and we want to really be who we say we are. In other words, we want to be authentic and not secretive, and that's the transparency. You know, we're not secretive. We're not holding back on finances. It's just that we have a greater treasure than finances. 
And so our focus is not on the finances, our focus is on the greater treasure. If you ask us about the finances, we will tell you about it. We will give you budgets and talk about needs and tell you our income. We are not secretive as an organization, but we are rather want to be transparent and uh, open. And that means keeping our focus on the greatest treasure, but also being willing to share with you when we uh, are asked about our financial policies and details. Accountability, of course, accountability has the fact that, to do with the fact that, you know, if you and I want to grow in Christ, if we want to be better stewards, if we want to honor Christ more and more, we will use every tool that God has given us to grow. And one of the tools that God has given us to grow is each other, our brothers and sisters. So it says, spur one another own to love and good deeds. So let's, let's ask your brother, what do you think? Is this good stewardship? And let's use this accountability in way to spur us on to really honor him and to serve him. And then um, this point number seven is a really a beautiful statement that I love. Um, and it says, We affirm our interdependence in the body of Christ, our call to collectively trust God, and the beauty of sharing God's corporate provision. Uh, we in WEC do not believe the statement that every man is an island. Uh, we believe that God has created the body of Christ and that uh, we are to be interdependent. We are to live together in, 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 in a sense of helping each other and caring for each other. And so there's this beautiful sense of interdependence and that when we're called to trust God, it's not just I'm called to trust God, but I'm called to trust God with you. And my trust is to help you to trust. And you're to help me to trust. And together we are to trust for His provision and trust for each other. And not only in our heart attitude, but in our actions, we are to share God's abundance. You know, God's abundant provision to me might be His blessing to me to be able to share with your need. And my need might be God's blessing to you to enable you to share with me. And so there's this beautiful sense of sharing together, of community, and it's not a shameful thing, it's a beautiful thing, in fact. We acknowledge that this is a beautiful thing. And I think Dan or anybody else who's worked in finances who has some insight into WEC finances behind the scenes will tell you how beautiful this works in WEC. WECers are constantly giving to each other. It's this amazing sense of those who have an abundance giving to those who are in need, and there's this incredible sense of a beautiful thing happening in WEC as we care for each other in this sense of interdependence. And of course, point eight we've already talked about. And then the final statement um, says we affirm, it's kind of a summary statement, it says we affirm the freedom the Holy Spirit gives as we apply these principles in our very cultural and legal context. Ultimately, it depends on an intimate relationship with God, Christ-like part attitudes, and the Holy Spirit's confirmation through the fellowship. In 2 Corinthians 3.17 it says, Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And of course we've already said that God provides in a multitude of ways. And we in WEC are a very diverse mission. And we come from very diverse cultural and legal contexts. And so while though we hold on to these core values, and we hope that these core values are going to be universally held by all WECers, we acknowledge that the practice of these core values, the expression of these core values, might vary in different cultural and legal contexts throughout the wet world. So we acknowledge that. Um, ultimately, again, we come back to this issue of the heart. It's not the behavior so much. It's the heart. And the heart will depend on uh, Christ-like heart attitude of really trusting Him and really treasuring Him and really looking to Him no matter what that practice is. It has to do with the heart. At the, at the bottom line. And then, of course, ultimately, you know, if we want to be pleasing to the Lord, if we want to be pleasing to the Lord if our practices, it's not just what is pleasing in my own eyes, but it's what is pleasing confirmed through the others, through my brothers and sisters. And so we look for a confirmation that this practice is pleasing and honoring to the Lord through the fellowship, through our leaders, through our brothers and sisters, through the fellowship, that confirms that this practice is in fact, we also agree, this is a God-honoring thing, so let's do it, and let's honor Christ. So that's our faith and finance policy. It's broad, it's general, but we really have a, a anticipation that this will help guard and guide us in WEC. Um, we hope that it will kind of be a, a renewal for us in some ways. I think we could use kind of a, a, a revival of this core value of really treasuring Christ and really trusting Him 
And really knowing that the practices that we utilize are there, not just because of P's and P's or it just came through CT stuff, but really are there with the potential to give God honor and glory. Um, so that's my